Hello and welcome to today's Writer in Residence session. I'm really happy to be introducing Steve Ince and he's one of the country's top gaming writers and designers. And Steve will share how to write stories for different types of gaming. We've also got our brilliant Writer in Residence, Christina Longdon. There'll be two sessions altogether. There's today's session and there'll be another one on the 25th of February at 11 o'clock. Um, but they'll be on, available to watch on Catch Up on Facebook, YouTube and our website. OK, so I'll hand over now to Chris and Steve to begin the session. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you very much, Nicola, for handing it over to us. Um, I'm going to just do a quick introduction to Steve. So I'm going to read a bit of biographical information about him. So um, those of you who are into gaming will know instantly why his work is so impressive and so important. And those of you that won't, hopefully will learn. Um, he is a writer, artist, game designer, consultant and speaker with 28 years of development and writing experience. And he gained a nomination for excellence in writing at the Game Developers Choice Awards in 2004 for Broken Sword. And that's called Broken Sword, the Sleeping Dragon, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. And he received a second nomination in 2008 from the Writers Guild of Great Britain for his writing on So Blonde. His book, Writing for Video Games, was published by ANC Black and he's sold it throughout the world. And sometimes it's used as a text in game writing courses as well. He often speaks at conferences and he clearly loves sharing his knowledge and his expertise. He's done a short film as well called Payment and that was released a couple of years ago to critical acclaim. And he's also written three fiction books. So I think he is more than qualified to, to help Help us to learn. We've got two sessions because um, this, you know, Steve could probably spend an entire week working with people on this. I'm sure he does. And I know he goes into schools a lot and he works with writers groups as well, which is how I found out about Steve through Script Yorkshire, which is it's basically a writers organisation for people that do script writing in Yorkshire. Where else? Um, so yeah. he's going to spend the next two sessions sharing his experience with us. And what we're going to do is because obviously Steve's going to do a presentation and show us how to construct the basics of a, of a storyline. You'll go into that a little bit more. If you've got questions, you can either send the questions in, either through Facebook or YouTube, and Nicola and I will keep an eye on any questions that are coming in. And if we don't answer your questions, or if you're still a little bit confused, don't forget there will be a second session on the 25th of February, but also you can go back and watch it again, thanks to YouTube. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Steve and I will disappear into the background and try and create my own story, she says. Um, but before, before I go, I've got to share this, this with you. I explained before that I don't do gaming. I haven't done gaming since Manic Miner days, since Jet Willy days. And that's for a number of reasons. I would love to get back into it again. But my first love uh, before Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy were these, the fighting fantasy game books. I've got all of them. I think like the first 10. I'm that old. Um, but this is why I was so interested in what Steve does, because I've always been interested in creating your own story and, and making up your own adventure. And it's you and you're in it and you're the star. But you're also engaged in a fantastic, unusual story. So hopefully, I'm sure you will. That's what Steve is going to help us all to do today. <laughs> Just out of interest, they've actually just released um, new new um, fighting fantasy books um, written by some uh, some recent authors, uh, including Rihanna Pratchett, who's a well-known uh, game writer. But hello, everybody. I'm uh, Steve Ince. Um, as you heard from my bio, I've uh, been around a, a bit and done quite a lot. <laughs> and I have quite a bit of experience in... in writing for games um, and this is a workshop which as it's been explained will be in two parts uh, and it will hopefully introduce you to interactive writing in general and game writing in particular and initially I'll talk about game, some game writing and why we love storytelling and move on to some of the things that you can do and although this is aiming at a, a younger people in general um, anyone with an interest in learning interactive writing will benefit from following along. And if you've downloaded Twine from twinery.org, you can work along with your own ideas as, as I talk or follow the video later at your own pace. 
And it doesn't take long to get familiar with the basics of twine. And once you do, I'm sure you're going to love telling stories this way. So, it's gone. There we go. <laughs> Now I've worked on a lot of different games and all of them have been with an em emphasis on narrative in some way. And I even wrote a book called Writing for Video Games, which came out quite a few years ago now. And I also created a game called Mr. Smoozles Goes Nutso, which I wrote, designed, created all the art for and put it together in something called Game Maker. Now, it's rare for one person to create a game, and usually it's very much a team endeavour, but it is possible, and certainly with interactive stories. Now, games are a huge industry and have gone from a small niche market to a huge industry where a large variety of people play, from young to old and across diverse lifestyles. Game writing has become a really important part of that industry. And here's a short clip of the kind of thing I often write. I want a word about Diablo. Really? He's nothing more than a big thug. That is the very reason I employ him. It's certainly not for his looks. Well, what have you owed me the cost of a new cell phone? Happy to smash mine. I'll put it on my list. You will? That's really good of you. My list of things to ignore. That was a game from a game called So Blonde, um, which um, I was nominated for an award for. Um, <laughs> and I had a great pleasure in working on, on that game with, for a French company. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's no proper sequel to that. Um, although there was a second game, but not a proper sequel. Now, game writing isn't just about the lines of dialogue, of course. It's about everything that goes into telling an exciting and compelling story. And we all have stories we want to tell. Now, this is a picture of Louis, my grandson, which was taken a few years ago when he was six. When I went to see him a few weeks later, he was wearing his costume again, but his shield was missing. So when I asked him where it was, he rummaged in his toy box and brought out a small one um, be that belonged to an action figure. When I said, it's a bit small, he quickly said, the bad guy shrinked it. We love making up stories and seem programmed to do so from an early age. And writing is a great way to tell our stories. So what makes game writing different to other forms of writing? Now, this is something that you might want to think about for a moment. And it's this, this, sorry, this difference that makes game writing exciting, but it's also a little difficult too interactivity. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean a game's story is interactive, but the story must fit with the nature of each game's particular approach to interactivity. Games have very different styles of gameplay. And, you know, so even in a particular style, you know, that, that can vary quite a bit. Game writers must appreciate those differences and ensure the writing complements them. So what is the role of the writer in the development of a game? Well, this can vary a lot from project to project and may involve story and character development, interactive plotting, scene development, dialogue, and so forth. And game writers rarely work on their own. They're usually part of a team. Now I may work from home on a freelance basis, but I constantly Zoom, message, and email other people in the team, whether they are up the road from me in York or thousands of miles away in Russia or America. Now, writing for games won't be everyone's plate of sprouts, but an awareness of what goes into game writing may help you in your wider career. There are an increasing number of interactive film projects and interactive theatre experiences taking place along with games that use live action as an important part of the finished product. Understanding how 
interactive stories and dialogue work within games can feed into those undertakings and vice versa, hopefully. So game writers, I think, must play games. In fact, all people who work in game development must, be, must play games. That may seem like an obvious thing to say, but I often meet people who don't play games yet think they have a great idea for a game. By playing games and researching various types of games, you can learn firstly how players might think when playing those games, and secondly, that there isn't a one game fits all when it comes to players. But when it comes to writing, the first step is to come up with ideas, of course. Ideas are like exercise for the brain, and without exercise, it might shrivel to nothing. I think most of us could come up with a hundred ideas a day, but sometimes we rack our brains because the problem isn't having the ideas, it's in starting to have them. Once they flow, it can be difficult to stop. So how might we start the creative juices flowing? Now most writers have their own methods for this, but I'm going to offer a suggestion. These are story cubes, and they're just one idea. But they can be very useful as part of your creative process because of the way they introduce potential story elements in random combinations. Not only are they available as physical dice, you can get an app for your phone too. Now, if used as intended, you throw the nine dice and make up a story from all of the uppermost images. However, if you're using them as a catalyst to fire up your imagination, you can use them in your own way. You can make the dice work for you because you're in charge of your own story. So as I've done a fair bit of talking already so far, let's get your brains into gear. Look at the pictures of the, on the cubes. Choose any three of the images you can see and come up with a three-line story based on them. The three images you choose should represent the beginning, middle and end of your brief story. The story can be about anything and in any genre. It's your story. You can be as open in your interpretation of the images as you wish. This isn't an exercise in restricting you, but in giving you a starting point. Now, if you're watching this as a later recording, you might want to pause the video while you do this. At this stage, don't worry about the exact spelling or grammar. You can always fix this later if you plan to show this, your story to others. This is about getting your ideas down, and it's, that is the most important part. Get your ideas down. Tell your three-line story, because no one's watching. No one's looking at you. No one's judging you. So while you're thinking about your own tale, I chose these three images and created a simple story to show the kind of thing I mean. One day, Gary received a strange invitation in the post. But the place on the invite was dark and the torch he always carried didn't have batteries. Then the lights went on and a round of applause rang out. It was a party for him. You can clearly see that I've used this, then this, then this, as my three images, the three parts of the story. The thing about such a brief tale is that there is little room for any deep story development. But I can use this example to illustrate how there can be power in our own use of words. Not only in what they say, but in what they don't say sometimes. Because I've not described Gary in any detail, you'll form your own ideas about him. His looks and the kind of person he is, for instance. Your minds fill in the missing details. Of course, I'm implying things in these words here. He's the kind of person who receives strange invitations. He has family and friends who like him enough to throw him a surprise party. 
And it's the sort of person who always carries a torch, even if he doesn't always renew their batteries. And from the way I've written it, most of you are likely to assume that Gary is roughly the same age as you. However, if I simply add one word, retirement, to the last line, it abruptly puts a different spin on who Gary is. A young person doesn't have a retirement party after all. The choice of words can be really important to the story you want to tell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the reason I ask you to choose just three images from the diet is because the beginning, middle and end of stories is something we often re refer to as structure, at least at a very basic level. But the simple nature of a beginning, middle and end becomes much more complex with longer and richer stories. In games, it is even more complicated because of their interactive nature. But for the moment, we'll stick to the basics and come back to that. Now we're going to learn the process of writing an interactive story using Twine, which you can either download to your computer or use directly online. Now this is the Twine website. You can download it here for Windows, here for Mac or Linux, or you can use it directly online in the browser window, um, which is incredibly valuable um, if, you don't, if your computer doesn't have much memory. However, it doesn't really take very much memory at all. Twine, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing like that. So if we return back, I've lost it. Oh, there we go. So if we go back to our basic structure again, our beginning, middle, and the end, we'll then we'll now look at that in Twine. This is Twine when you open it. You won't have these ten stories. Um, because, you know, sort of like you should have not created anything so far. But, you know, sort of if I bring this up, um, this is, you know, sort of like exactly the same structure as my diagram. And if I hit the play button at the bottom, we get um, the first line of the story. One day Gary received a strange invitation in the post. Click on the link and we get the second part. But the place on the invite was dark and this torch he always carried didn't have batteries. Then the lights went on and a round of applause rang out. It was a party for him. So if we go back To twine if I go back to the home page it's time for you to have a go so if you if you have twine open like this you can create your own story um, but I will issue a slight warning <laughs> um, it's best not to use twine with a caps lock on uh, this can cause problems with the way twine works um, with the, We've discovered this the hard way through previous workshops. Um, so it's best if you um, keep you know, sort of typing normally when you need to type. Um, but to add a, add a story to Twine, you click on the Add Story button, the big green button here on the right. And then you can call it anything you like. So like. Click the green ad book. And what this does is this opens up a grid. Um, and you've got what's no what you can see here is an untitled passage. Um, all these these blocks in here are called passages and they can be as long as or the contents of them can be as long or as short as you wish. 
Um, and you can position these where you like. So if you're, and then you can drag that around with the middle mouse button as well. I, I don't know if there's another way. Um, but if I edit this using the pencil icon, it takes us to this. Now I'm going to hide that or those um, tool icons because um, we're going to approach it in a slightly different way. Um, you can double click on this to edit it as it says, but you can also delete it and then you get this uh, basic information um, available. And if I If I go back to here, you can probably see it a little clearer. And what these are, are various useful things like creating ball or italics and things like this and, and so on. Um, but we'll, we'll, you know, some of these things you don't need to worry about at this stage. And so we'll, um, we'll introduce certain things as we go through the workshop. So if we go back um, to Twine, and I can edit some, enter some text, and as soon as you enter text, all the the, te the, the grey text there will, will vanish. So this is the start of the story. Now, if it, in order to be for it to be interactive, we need to create a link and we create a link by typing in double square brackets and you can see that clearly enough double square back brackets or any other type of brackets there must be double square brackets and when you go into the middle of them it explains that these brackets are a hook um, or as I've called it a link um, and you can type into it, you can call it uh, two. I'm also going to give this uh, a title called part one. If I close that, this untitled passage is now changed and we putting that link in there is automatically created a new passage for us. And again, we can drag it wherever we like. Some people like to work vertically. Um, personally, I, I, I like to work horizontally, but then as you develop your story, you'll probably find you, you're doing a bit of both. Um, so if we then edit that, we it's already got its, its name we can we can add some more text we can create another link and that's how we, we essentially create our three part story. And obviously, you know, sort of like if you've already created your story from the story cubes, then you can use that um, to, to fill in this, which, you, which will obviously save, save you time, but you can create something new. Um, and then you can play it by, by clicking on the play button at the bottom. So this is the start of the story, the middle part of the story, and the end. So if you play your stories and it doesn't work, check that you've got your formatting right with your double um, square brackets. Um, but something like this should play very easily 
face time off. So if we look at this, you know, sort of this story is represented, you know, sort of like it's a bit longer than the three part story. The arrows are, are a representation of gameplay. Um, and the black dots and squares are the story notes. Um, and if we look at this, I, although we have a beginning, middle and end that encompasses the whole thing, we can look at the beginning, middle and end of the various aspects as well. Um, because, you know, sort of each story note kind of its own beginning, middle and end, and each you know, section of gameplay can have its own beginning, middle and end. And this is how you build up structure in an interactive way. Now, this is obviously a simple narrative. It's what we call as, you know, sort of like game on rails, as it were. So if I switch back to Twine and go to the home page, I can open this, which I prepared earlier, um, which is um, basically a story I've created based upon the first Broken Sword game, or the very first part of the first Broken Sword game. Um, and I've just made it, you know, so I've modified it into a very basic form here. And if I play it, you can see that there is much more detail in the story, you know, sort of, so sitting outside a Paris cafe, American George Stobart enjoys the autumn sunshine. Suddenly, a man in a clown costume runs out of the cafe, and a moment later, there's an explosion inside it. Make it larger. As the dust settles, George picks himself up and is appalled by the devastation. He resolves to investigate this dreadful crime. But no sooner has George begun his investigation than he is questioned by the police, though not arrested. The police tell him not to get involved, but George wants to know who nearly killed him. He quickly meets up with a young journalist, Nicole Collard, who suggests that this is simply the latest in a series of linked murders, although the police are denying it. The two agree to work together and share any leads they uncover. Heading in the direction the killer escapes leads George into the sewers, and while they prove to be distinctly unpleasant, he discovers clues left by the killer. George calls up Nico and gives her the news, and she tells him that the clues point to a costume shop where the killer must have obtained his disguise. The owner of the costume shop is evasive at first, but eventually gives the name of the customer who bought the clown costume along with some other disguises, Khan. Using this name, George is able to track him down to a small hotel called the Ubu. George is forced to distract the hotel's desk clerk in order to get the key to Khan's room. But when he enters it, he finds the killer is not there. He decides to lie and wait for him. When the killer returns, George surprises him and is able to capture him before Khan can resist. With the killer secure, George calls Nicole to tell her the good news, then makes a call to the police. Investigation complete. So you can expand your own story um, in a similar way. Add more detail, make it richer. You know, so I'll begin writing another one that's a bit more involved, if you wish. But what if we want to put more interactivity into our stories? <coughs> Excuse me. So structure and interactivity, these two words might seem at odds with each other. How can your story have structure if you allow it to be interactive? Well, that depends on how you define structure and how rigid it needs to be when building detail. So as I said, you know, sort of looking at the very basic shapes of beginning, middle and end, not only will it fit the overall largest structure, it can be applied to the smaller parts too. You know, sort of like even in films and TV, like 
each act will have its own beginning, middle and end. Each scene will have its own beginning, middle and end. And so you can work down into finer detail. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're playing a game and you have to make a choice. You find out, you find that there are two doors facing you, pretty indistinguishable from each other. Which door do you go through? So make a choice, go through door one or go through door two. Those who chose door one have all just died, and those who choose, chose door two lose all of their gold. Now that's unfair, right? But that's how some games give choice to players. There's no way to know in advance or to work out what will happen until after you've made that choice. You can only learn about the consequences of the choice by making it, which can be really annoying for the player particularly if their character dies as a result. It can sometimes feel that developers don't care about being fair to the player. So games should always be created with the player in mind, even if you're simply creating an interactive story with no other game player. You still need to take the reader into deep consideration. In games, the player is instrumental in moving the gameplay and the story forward. <laughs> By the way, if anyone didn't choose either of the doors earlier, that's perfectly all right. It shows that sometimes the choices in games aren't always obvious. And from a developer's point of view, the nature of interactivity means you can't always be sure that the player will make the choices in the way that you expect. Or if we open up the gameplay, gameplay between the narrative nodes and give the player the freedom to play each level as they see fit, we can still keep the story relatively straightforward. But we might also maybe give multiple endings if the final part of the story relates to the way the game has been played. So if we have a look at a multiple endings example, um, we can see that, you know, sort of like this is relatively simplistic. Um, but if I show um, the last but one scene, um, you can see how, you know, sort of basically the, the, the endings are, are created from a series of links. Um, but notice how I've put the links into sentences to make them more readable. So, if I play this, we essentially get the same story until we get to this point. And now there are a number of options available. George, you can hide, you can call Nico on the phone, you can call the police, you can sit on the bed and wait. So if we try this last one, we get, because he's in this position, he's unable to react quickly enough when Khan enters and on seeing George pulls out a gun. The killer shoots him, gathers his belongings and leaves. George has failed to trap the killer. Now it's obviously you know, sort of like a failure. So, you know, sort of, it, you know, it might not be a satisfying option for the player. So we can actually, in this, using Twine, we can actually go back and choose something else. So we can hide um, because he's hidden. George surprises him and is able to capture him before he can resist. So the investigation is complete. Um, you can call Nico on the phone, but unfortunately, Calm overhears um, this conversation from outside the hotel room and makes his getaway, and George has failed to apprehend the killer. So he can call the police. This time um, they tell him they are on their way and tell him to get out of there. But he hears the killer at the door and climbs out of the window and onto the ledge where he's forced to wait until the police arrive and arrest Calm. 
the killer is brought to justice. So we've got four, you know, sort of different endings there. Some of them he failed to apprehend, one of which has, has ended in him being killed. Um, so we can have variety there, um, you know, sort of. And, and so what you can do then, what you can do now, is turn your own story into one with multiple endings. Think carefully about how you might do this. If you don't want to change your existing story, you can create a duplicate of it on the home page. So if I go back here, go back to the home page, if we take the on rails version, so if there is um, a cog just under each one of these stories, if you click on that, you can duplicate the story. So here we have on rails copy, we can you can call it multiple ending two because I've already got one called multiple endings and click on duplicate and so we get the multiple endings and you can edit this one leaving your original story safe but because i don't need it at the moment i shall delete a story if you accidentally click on it then you'll get a message you know so if you want to cancel that you can but you know sort of it will delete it forever there is no there is no going back so be wary of deleting stories. Um, where are we? I love my players now. <laughs> so creating multiple um, endings will likely test the story that you're trying to tell. You know, you maybe thought of just one ending, you know, so, but um, you know, so so you know, trying to say, you know, sort of think of alternate alternative alternative endings can be quite quite tricky at times but uh, they can be also be quite fun how you're going to do this you know with the, with the existing characters so now we're going to look at branching narrative if the player makes an in-game decision that affects the flow of the narrative it may well create a branch in the story that will lead to a number of different um, separate storylines which go off along here for instance um, now this can work in a similar manner to the multiple endings example but the choices will happen earlier in the game for instance you might have to choose between saving the dog or the baby or your best friend or your sister or the case full of money whichever you choose is likely to define how the rest of the story and game unfolds also, whichever storyline plays out for you, the other possibilities are often closed off for the rest of the game. So if we switch to Twine again, and I open Branching Narrative, you can see how um, this works. Again, I'm developing this, this broken sword idea simplified broken sword idea so if i actually look here um we've got similar start to the, to the story as before but we we've got three options for the player to choose um which give us these three lines so if i play this um we've got a second we've got this um story and the three choices. So I could enter the Rex Cafe, you know, sort of, and George revives the waitress and questions her. He discovers the old man acted nervously <clears throat> before the clown came in and stole his briefcase. So I search for the briefcase. George leaves the cafe, cafe, but there is no sign of the clown. He sees a young woman taking pictures, and then we can have more story and so on. Um, so this gives us different avenues to go down. So he looks for the killer, he talks to the white man up the street. So what we're doing is rather than leaving a choice um, 
to the end of it, or, or you know, sort of like to give multiple endings at the end of the game, we're moving it to the beginning in this instance. Now think about how you would create a choice at the beginning of your story and how it would impact on the direction the narrative takes from the beginning. Don't forget, you can du duplicate your story if you want to, or begin again. Now once you start doing this, how does this approach affect the way you view your story? Do you see it differently? Has it become a different beast entirely? Or is it, or does it become three separate stories that are from in parallel? How do you view this? So if we go back to our beginning, middle and end idea and our branch and storyline, it reduces, essentially reduce the player choice to a single example at the beginning of the game. The game's story could be so much more interesting and engaging if there were multiple points where the player could make meaningful choices. The danger with this is how do you stop it running out of control if at every level of this you know sort of story you are making multiple choices. You know, sort of by the time you get to the end, you could have hundreds of different endings. Now, many player, many games give um, plenty of player agency, as this is called, um, but still manage to keep the story under control. The choices can link to a fixed number of story notes, but the player is free to find their own path through them. Even in this simple example, there are nine different paths through the story. And expanding this idea some more means that we can create more complex stories <coughs> excuse me, for the player to find their way through, while still maintaining a good degree of control. Now, the choice at the beginning of Broken Sword didn't actually lead to parallel stories, but it changed the flavour of the beginning due to the choices the player made. And this is an example of how you might want to set up a much more complex structure. There are sections of open gameplay and places where the player must return to a kind of hub in order to move forward. And it's perfectly feasible to set up a situation where the player is given the same list as char of characters to save as before, but this time they could maybe save them in a you know, different order, or oh, sorry, rather, save each of them, but you know, sort of take them in turn. And the player could choose the order in which to save them. This could still have an effect on the way the narrative moves forward. For instance, your sister could be really angry with you if you didn't save the baby first. So if I now open a much more complex narrative, we can see that you know a similar kind of approach is taken to this story where we've got cross links and back links and, and, and so forth. And how this is how you get much more richness into um, into a game. But you can see that the flow gets very complex very quickly. And even if you don't use something like Twine to map your story out, you you usually need to develop flow charts in some other way to keep track of all the possible paths. Of course, you don't have to make it as complex as this, as this but if you want. You can make it even more complex if that's you know the way you like things. You could look into one <coughs> of those nodes, and we could create even more detail within the node if should we wish to do so. But the structure of your game and the amount of complexity it contains are down to you and the team that you you're working with. So if we play this one. We have the similar 
digging in again we can we've got seemingly the same choices so we can enter at the rect cafe and but now we've got three choices again here because we're not limiting it to one path from this point so you can search for the briefcase we get more we need to you know add in more story we can look for the killer george enters the alley across the street and finds out that the killer must have escaped through the sewers george descends into the darkness with some trepidation george searches the sewer and finds some clues the killer left behind so you can call nicole except strangely we haven't yet met nicole so if we go back george is just about to talk to the workman and ask and ask him if he saw anything when the police show up the detective in charge takes george back to the cafe for questioning so we get you know sort of the option to to go back to the back to the cafe again we can meet nicole so what we're finding here is that there are a lot of narrative loops we've got problems getting things out of order and stuff like this and this is a you know a very problem problematical thing as soon as you start looking at this kind of linkage you want to be able to go back and try new things and try things that you haven't tried before you've got to be very careful that you're not introducing things before <clears throat> before you um can do so before logic states um but if you actually try to do this with your story concentrate on how you might you know kind of use these types of links and think about the problems that you're having next time in the next session we will look at how we can deal with this but i think that for now there is an awful lot to think about um, and you know sort of it's a good place to stop you can go away and write your own stories your own interactive stories and in the next session we will address some of the questions you might have um, before continuing with more detail and an introduction to boolean variables which will help us control some of the problems that we have in this kind of you know linking structure so that is been a lot for you to take in i guess um so it's probably a really good place to um end for now um i don't know if chrissy or chris or nicole have anything that they want to ask um, uh, well, yeah. got a comment, Julia? That was oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> I even I even ran downstairs to get them <laughs> because uh, you know in the days before we had screens in the car or allowed to when travelling. These are fantastic for kids. Um, my son had, had a slight speech delay, so we were told to to get him to do some storytelling, and we had such a fantastic time with these. You know, as as grown ups in a party or, or with your kids, fantastic. And I actually I I got them not through through the writing reasons, but to help my kids. Um, and my kids struggled playing games until they were. A lot, a lot older um, and this is uh, what i love about this is it's not a competitive game and, and i just love that it's creative and it gets yeah. kids yeah. who are perhaps shyer speaking out in the classroom for example just they give you give them a chance and a, and a quiet setting to develop stories and i suppose that leads me to my question steve thank you for that that was fantastic and i was kind of dreading looking at twinery because i'm maybe one of these people that, that kind of freezes a little bit when, when i'm faced with a new system um and and you really helped me i've been doing stuff here on my screen trying to plot a story um i've stopped at the point where we go really multiple so i'm hoping to yeah, maybe yeah. twiddle around with that next but you, you explained that really well and i just encourage anybody who who's going uh, I'm not sure now, just, just to go back and keep watching this video until you feel more confident. And the, the one thing I would say as well is, um, 
you're not going to do anything wrong, are you? Because I think a lot of people, when they try anything new out online, mm -hmm. they're scared that they'll do something wrong or they'll break something. And just to reassure people, well, if, you're not going to do that, are you? Yeah, the problem is that people do get get afraid of, of doing something wrong in the sense that it's, you know, kind of, um, oh, what if, what if I destroy the whole system? And it doesn't work like that way. You know, sort of, it, it will only... It might, it might, you might accidentally delete one of your own stories or something like this. Um, but as I say, there is that big, do you really want to do this kind of thing? Um, there is always that safeguard there. Um, and, you know, sort of like, if in doubt, create a new story. If in, you know, sort of like, just, just, you know, sort of like step back, start again. And I think that, that you know, sort of, it's not about being brave, it's just about, saying, well, you know, sort of, I've done that wrong, let's, let's start again. Or, you yeah. know, kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll delete that line because it's not working, or I'll delete that link because it's not working, and, and so on. And, and then uh, you du I duplicate mine straight away when you said that, because I thought, well, at least I've got another one if I, make, if I muck up the first one. Yeah, I mean, you know, sort of, I mean, I do that all the time with, with my documents, you know, kind of, mm. like, you know, sort of, um, every, every time I go into edit, I you know, sort of create a new version, you know, this is version one, this is version two, you know, and I end up with tons of, of, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, me too. And I never delete any of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my dad, my dad always, whenever he goes anywhere near my computer, he's horrified that there's just files and files and files and files. Just, just that's the way I work, but yeah. I think, I think it makes your computers, you you know, sort of, you can save so much. You can, yeah. you know, sort of like go through multiple versions because you never know when you might want to go back to an earlier version and, and pull out, you know, sort of part of the story or, you know, yeah, chat exactly. from a book that, that, that worked better in a previous version or, or something along these lines, you know, so you just never know. And it's the yeah. same with that work, you know, sort of like, oh, I need to change this, this character a lot, you know, sort of. So I'll just create a new Photoshop file and, and or, or create a copy of the of this existing Photoshop file and use that one. So I've still got the old one to go back to. So it's not just that way, yeah. it's about all, everything. You know, and you end up with a lot of files, but it's better than yeah, you know, the key to the, the key to doing it properly is to name them all sensibly. Yes, you know, exactly. So, so yeah. you know where yeah. you're going, you know, and um it's not difficult to hunt them down and you know so like name all your folders sensibly and things um but with something like twine i mean what, another beauty of it is that it saves as it's going along so you're never having to worry about saving mm. you know sort of yeah. and if you use the would... version then it's saving to to you know the cloud effectively yes so yeah so it's still there um, so don't know, panic <laughs> Yeah. Just, <laughs> like, one of the things, one of the things that I found is, you know, doing doing um, workshops in, in schools is, you know, sort of like kids, no matter their writing ability, um, they they get into twine very quickly. Yeah, I can see they, that. They yeah. Tell stories. I mean, one of the reasons that I kind of mentioned earlier about caps lock being a bad idea was mm -hmm. it's just like to write in caps lock for some reason. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and they were getting some serious problems. Oh, I can't create these links there, uh, or you know, and it's been, and it's just something that Caps Lock does. I don't know if it's been fixed. To be honest, I haven't tried it recently, um, so it might have been fixed. But you know, don't do Caps Lock, kid. It's best not to write with Caps Lock on anyway. <laughs> okay, we, we've got some lovely comments. I'll show up some of these. There we go. Um, someone says, it was a really good session for me and helped me begin to think how a story can be used in a game format. As being a gamer, I would definitely start to experiment on this now on, from now on. So that's lovely. Thank that's you. great, thanks. <laughs> and then, got to know they're not being a gamer. <laughs> I know I know. <laughs> but writing the sequel to By the High Ice Hawks Feather, I'm thrilled about the twinery and story cubes hint. That alone is worth a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. That I, I absolutely ag agree with with both of you on that. I think this is this is what's really valuable about this session. You can be a game and get a lot out of this, but also mm -hmm. you know somebody like me who I write stories really organically and they're all up here. So when I do yeah. when I was trying this now, I was thinking there is no way I could I could sit out and, and even though I enjoy like reading you know the, the multiple choice 
old fashioned stories. I couldn't come out with this and that and that. So, so I guess my question is um, a, a little bit like, Steve, would you advise somebody like me who's writing and maybe stuck on this going, I can't think of an ending to chat to somebody else about what ifs? Because I find I've only recently started doing this and a lot of it's to do with my, I think I'm quite private about my writing. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a whole background thing if you don't talk about writing. But I've found that when I do say to my other half, oh, I'm doing this, and he comes out with some great ideas. And the kids do too. But yeah. it's, it doesn't come natural to me to run it past somebody else. I feel that it should all be from me somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's natural, you know, sort of like when we're, you know, sort of like um, formulating our ideas and, and giving birth to our stories kind mm. of. You know, we want to be protective of that. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to show them to somebody, particularly in the early stages, when, yeah. you know, sort of like you might have a very rough draft with, you know, bad grammar and all sorts of spelling mistakes and stuff like this, because, you know, you, you're just being interested in getting the, the story down. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sort of like um, Wakening Games has cured me of that. <laughs> Basically, because, you know, sort of like when I started working on site, you've got to kind of show things at an early stage, which share them with the rest of the team, you know, sort of like you might just have an outline, you know, kind of like, oh, yes, you know, sort of like we've got this, this idea for the story where, you know, sort of like we're going to have the main character investigate, you know, kind of mythology of ancient Rome or something like this. You know, sort of, and then you kind of expand on that a bit and you show it again and you expand on it and you show it again. And, and, you know, sort of, and it's, it's not just, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a multi-way street, if you like. So, mm. you know, the, the character artists will will create sketches or, or, you know, create rough models in 3D or stuff like this. And then, you know, sort of like the environment people will, will maybe come up with some colour schemes or, you know, kind of potential location ideas. And so so everybody's sharing stuff from yeah. very early in the project, you know, sort of, for the most part. And at least... This helps, I think, because you know that everybody's in the same boat. It's not just you sharing your story. But I think that, that you know, sort of, you've got to, in a sense, you kind of got to get over that. Not because, you know, sort of, it's, it's you know, sort of, it, it's, it's, ne it's a necessity. But I think, as you said, you show it to people and they might, uh, you know, sort of give you good, great feedback and, and suggest great ideas. Or they might kind of say, well, I didn't understand that. You know, so yeah. you know, you maybe you maybe it may be clear in your own head, but you've just not put that down on you know, yeah, on, yeah. on, on paper as it were, or on the virtual paper. But um, I think I think this process really helps you to what you know when you sit and watch TV or you think, oh, that didn't really work for me, you know. And often it's not so much because the characters might be a bit flat and one-dimensional, but because they the there just isn't enough in terms of the story. Um, yeah. So I think if you're not used to storytelling, this is just a fantastic little mm -hmm. gift to to maybe go away with and play around with until the next session. Um, yeah. Yeah. If people, maybe that, I guess, maybe that's how we lead today, which is we can encourage people to go around and, and, and you know, practice this over the next couple of weeks, then hopefully they'll come back with some good yeah. stories, yeah. examples and questions. Twine, is you can you can create this structure without necessarily putting in the detail you can always wake up the detail later so yeah. you might you know kind of you, you might know that you want a scene in which you know the character discovers you know sort of an ancient artifact and then that leads on to maybe two or three other things you know sort of yeah so you need to actually put in the detail of how he discovered that artifact just that he discovered that artifact and then you know so you can develop your whole story like that um mm -hmm. And then go back and fill in the details, and then you know, sort of like work out, you know, where there are additional links, and where whether the character, you know, the story needs to link back to an earlier passage, you know, and, and so on. Are, are there examples that we can go and look at on Twine of you know stories that are finished or stories you know in development yeah, or yeah. complex, very complex ones? Yeah, it's, it's, I've lost it now. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. If I can share my screen again very briefly. And go back to, if you look at the Twine website, uh -huh. um, and if you scroll down, there yeah. are. Oh, fab. 
yeah, hundreds. Quite a few, great hundreds of right. Of there are samples. Excellent. You know, people yeah. incorporated pictures. That's yeah. Um, that's useful. obviously a bit more, a bit outside of the, the, the scope of this, but it's not it, it's not difficult to yeah. to um, find information for that because there is there is a help. Um, you know, if you within twine itself. Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm, <laughs> there's so many things open at the moment. That's great. No, it's, it's all there. That that's. I think that's what people will want to yeah, maybe under, do. Under just to have a bit of a play. Guy. Um, and and that is quite cool. Um, that shows you how to kind of put images into, you know, sort of into your stories and 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 do lots of other cool things. You can even put videos in. I think, you know. So so there's all sorts of things. I mean, you could create an interactive story that uses bits of video you know like like we were talking about with yes <laughs> but just before we finished i wanted to mention that as well because yeah, um it's something that i've often wondered about but you mentioned this to me trylife.tv is um interactive acting uh, you need to go and see it um, and, and play one of the games and it's a great way for young people to explore in a safe environment choices very important choices that you can make in life as you say with no judgment attached but there are actors acting out these storylines and you get to be one of the stars of the show and you get to choose what direction you take and yeah that, that yeah, I, you I, know i, I think I, it's great it up on my, you know, if, if you show, show the sharing again yeah the trial life is, is great fun trialife.tv and there are now you know five episodes, um, which are all very different. All I'd love this to be in every school because it's just bad. About... Um, but so you might want to check with your parents if you're. Yes. <laughs> about you know so so the high so school six formish mid mid school, end of high school. Think, but but you know sort of the quality of, of store interactive storytelling through video. It's um, fantastic. It's, it's wow. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also share with you um, this on here. So this is Steve's book. Steve's book. Yay, writing for video games. And it is available tomorrow as an ebook on our There you site. go. It's fantastic. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, Nicola. Okay. And we've got Steve up again on the 25th, haven't we? For the yes, second right. session. Yes. Yes. Same time, 11 o'clock, 25th of February. Yes. Keep watching this video. Get your head around it all and tell people about it who who wouldn't have had the chance to, because they might have been at school or at work, um, to to yes. to have a look back and and yeah, do a bit of homework for the next session. So I'm gonna be doing mine with my kid. I'm gonna be <laughs> Well, then please please send them in and we'll we'll start Thank you, yeah. that next session with that yeah, yeah that'd be that'd be yeah. really great if, if people struggle over the next couple of weeks steve's going to be around and just you know get in touch and yeah. get your questions ready for him be okay yeah. before we go today we'd like to just um point out next week we've got um the peaky back our next writer in residence session will be the peaky blinders in conversation with carl chain and that's next Thursday at 11th of February, but it's at half past six in the evening. Um, so it isn't at 11, it's at half past six. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so join us if you can. Very exciting. Yeah, really exciting. Suitable <laughs> for all age groups. Um, you don't have to, have, you don't, yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, there's no bad language. It's me, I, you know, I don't do that online. Um, it's me and Professor Carl Chin, who is the expert on this period in history and the Peaky Blinders, whose ancestor was a, a Peaky Blinder. So we're going to be talking about the history of the times, um, the TV series, you know, what elements were true, you know, in terms of the TV series. So if you're a Peaky's fan or if you're a history fan, um, particularly social history of this era, please join us because that's why we're doing it in the evening as well because you know the, the more the merrier and the more questions that we get in and um yeah i think it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a bit different yeah <laughs> okay oh, thank you thank you everybody thanks everybody for watching and for your lovely comments and thank you ever so much to steve <laughs> take care bye-bye <laughs> everyone take bye. care bye <laughs>